Hello, folks, and welcome to another episode of Hidden Treasures. My name is Bill Safer. Uh, I'll be your host, as I said, and I want to welcome you to the studios of WCCA-TV, coming to you from downtown Worcester. Uh, I have a very interesting and fascinating special guest today, uh, who we will get to in a moment, <laughs> and I know you'll find this interesting. Uh, I'd like to thank Bill Hamilton helping us out today uh, because Frank, the, the director who's usually here, couldn't make it here. So he was kind enough to come in and substitute for Frank. And as I told him in person, he can take $1,000 out of petty cash and tell him that I said so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now before I introduce my very special guest, I, I do shout outs, I do hellos, or I call them shout outs to people that have either been on the show, watched the show, or just I happen to like their business. So I mostly have small businesses here uh, because I think McDonald's and Burger King can do it themselves. But uh, I'd like to say uh, my first shout out, hello to Veterans Inc. on Grove Street in Worcester. Uh, Colonel Perone and his staff do a fantastic job of taking wonderful care of a good number of our homeless veterans, men and women. Um, if it was not for Veterans Inc., I know that a lot of those vets would have passed away a long time ago because they give them a room, they give them food, they give them medical care, and they let them live there until they get established on their own. Mm -hmm. So it's a wonderful thing we have in Worcester. And I would like to also say hello to Brittany Miller Lagasse, who is the president of Park Spirit. She was a guest on the show, and they voluntarily take care of 60 parks that Worcester has, cleaning them up, establishing signs, removing debris. It's amazing, and if you go to parkspirit.org on the internet, you can see um, how many parks there actually are, the 60, and it tells where they are. Some of them you'll never expect, and some of them you know quite well, like Elm Park and Green Hill Park. So go to the website and uh, you'll find it very interesting. And you can buy this pamphlet or this book really uh, on the website. So thank you, uh, Brittany, uh, for coming on the show and for you and your crew doing all the work you do do. And she's the president. Okay, now is the time that I would be, I am honored to introduce <laughs> my very special guest uh, is Tony DeLuca, the wine manager of Julio's Market. And I want to thank you very much thank for coming you. on the thank show. Thank you, Bill. It's a uh, pleasure. Thank you. I mean, I followed your, I follow your posts. I follow your, where you travel about tasting <laughs> wine. I mean, it's. You're a, one of my biggest fans. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm glad to because yeah. uh, you're so entertaining on your shows and the wines and how you give people tips and hints. I mean, you travel, you travel more than the galloping gourmet. I mean, you're always all, all over the place. So that's you gotta great. Have, you have to have a perk, right? Yes, yes. So. Now, it is, as I, as I mentioned, you told me it was, it's Julio's. Yeah, a, a, lot a, lot of people, of, a lot of people think it's Julio's. Um, but yeah, it's Julio's after an Italian man who's named Julio, the grandfather of the owner. Yeah. Um, and the owner's Ryan Maloney. So, oh, excellent. Yeah. Now, I've, I've been to Julio's several times, and I was amazed at what they had there because it wasn't only wine and beer, and, but the, there was cheese, there were chocolates, there was hot sauce, there was sodas, there was, mm -hmm. I can't even name all the things, there was salamis and, and yeah. meats and things like that. So uh, if you think that it is just uh, wine and beer, that would be good enough, but it's also <laughs> other things. It's worth it. Uh, now, Tony, um, I always like to ask, uh, I know it's Julio's Liquors, but for mm -hmm. our viewers, could you tell them the address, uh, phone number, and if you have a website? Yeah, sure. It's um, 140 Turnpike Road. Um, so if you're in Worcester, you would be driving Route 9. It's right off of Route 9. You'd go Route 9 East towards Framingham. And basically, the store is right after Shrewsbury. Okay. So as you're probably about 20 minutes from the center of Worcester, not not too far to get to. It's in the same plaza. There's a Starbucks next to us. We have a Staples, oh, um, yes, a Home yeah. Goods. It's called the Westboro Shopping Plaza. Um, the phone number, modern technology has ruined me. Oh, no. um, if, I, if it's not plugged into my phone, I don't have me it memorized, which is bad, <laughs> which is really bad. But the phone number is 508-366-1942. 
Um, and our email is, and you can catch us um, on our website, which is juliosliquor.com. Um, and we have a live store, so if you can't make it out, um, you can always order online and we can ship to you. you so, well, yeah. yeah. And now, was, hasn't it been fairly recently that uh, wines and liquors were allowed to be shipped in Massachusetts? Yeah, you could. That was from other states. Um, I think you could always, as long as you have somebody who's 21 there to sign for the package, you could ship within Massachusetts. Oh, but it was receiving um, from other states. It was oh. blocked off. But about a year ago, they changed that. Yeah, I notice uh, a lot of the places in Maine, the uh, breweries and the small wineries, they say we ship all over the U.S. You know, there's a place up yeah. there that makes mead. Uh, yeah. And I've never had it, but I want to try it. That, if I'm correct, isn't mead made out of honey? Yeah, yeah. And actually, one of my favorite meaderies is right in Massachusetts in Blackstone Valley, um, and it's called Crave Mead, and it's a small family owned. They, If you like mead, I'll bring you a bottle next time, Bill, but they have a great selection. Oh, thank you, yeah. Tony. Yeah, I, yeah. Um, I, I love to visit wineries. I mean, I've been mm -hmm. to Neshoba. And I've been to even a little one in Hardwick, Mass. Yeah. Where um, I is had it the Hardwick Winery and yes, Vineyard? Yeah, that's yes. a great. I mean, it's small, but they have a beautiful shop, mm -hmm. and they use, believe it or not, I found out a bit of history um, that they use cranberries that are grown in Hardwick. They actually have a cranberry bog wow. in Hardwick. Everybody thinks it's Plymouth in that area, yeah. but they make enough to make their own cranberry wine. Uh, and it was really good. I bought a bottle of, of cranberry, uh, the yeah, sweet one, of course. They also actually have um, pear, pear trees um, on the winery, and they just started re making their own homemade pear wine. Oh, um, and they do the same thing with blueberry. They actually have a fantastic dry blueberry that drinks a lot like a Merlot. So I, that's one of my favorite local wineries. Oh, yeah, excellent. Yeah, it's a great one. I, I'll have to start going back to the places <laughs> I used to go. Now that the weather, changing. yeah, when the, the weather's starting to get nicer, so yeah. it's good to take a day jaunt and go and visit. Yeah, um, when I have to build an igloo near the entrance to get in in the morning, I know that's <laughs> probably should wait till the nicer weather. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, in your store, you have wines from all over the world. Mm -hmm. You also have sherries and ports and masalas and yeah, things of that nature. Yeah, fortified, sparkling, everything. Yeah. Um, could, now, just for the winos, I mean the viewers out there. Um, <laughs> My fellow wine snobs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me too. Um, could you explain the difference between, I know the color is red and white, but yeah. like red wine versus white wine and how do you know what foods go with what wine? Yeah, totally. So basically, I'll start kind of quickly at the beginning because a lot of people are confused with what even is wine. So wine is very specific. It's um, an alcoholic product that is made from fresh grape must. And that's important because anyone probably would think, well, well, then why don't I just get Walter's grape off the shelf and try to ferment my own right, wine? Right. That is not tr traditional wine that's illegal. So it has to be fresh um, grape must. And the fermentation process is interesting. There's ambient yeast all around us. There's yeast in this room right now. Um, probably the very beginnings of wine was a weird thing because it was hunters and gatherers collecting berries. The berries would get squished in their hand and the live, the natural yeast that lived in the area that was on the bloom of the skin would start naturally fermenting the wine. It was probably a very crude. I don't think I would have enjoyed drinking <laughs> it, but I'm sure the hunters and gatherers at that time were liking the effects of the alcohol yes. and they probably didn't mind so much. Um, but yeah, the byproducts of, so yeast attacks the, the grape juice, converts the sugar into alcohol and carbon dioxide, and that's basically how wine is made. So, so without so, yeast, we'd have nothing. So, you but. know, it's funny, I, I've heard of uh, people using so-called wild yeast, or yeast in the air, and cheese making, and mm -hmm. some baking even, like uh, friendship breads and things like yeah. that. Some of them have a starter with yeast, sometimes mm -hmm. they, they say leave it out. And, Not uh, every winemaker now, everything's very technological. There are some, there's a big movement to kind of use more, um, you know, ambient yeast, natural yeast, and um, instead of yeast that can be purchased, um, right. you know, through a store. And right, there's so many different strains. Winemakers have the ability to, basically there's a catalog of yeast that they can pick from um, and pick the one that would best wow. suit them. But it's a little bit trickier to do it. Um, to do it kind of naturally because you never know. Sometimes the yeast doesn't finish. Sometimes you're left with a product that has sugar at the end because the yeast can't 
finished the, the process. But, um, but regardless, that's kind of the basis to it. And then you have, you know, white, rosé, and red. And white wine made from white grapes, from um, grape varieties such as Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Grigio, those are probably the three most popular. Um, and it's a really quick process where they take the grapes and they either do a, a whole berry press or they crush them and then press, but there's no skin contact there. If you were to take a grape, and even you can test this at home next time you get table grapes, okay. if you were to take a grape and split it open, the the juice, the pulp, is clear. Yes. And it's the contact with the skin that extracts pigmentation and um, flavor compounds and um, phenolic compounds that adds extra body color and um, fl uh, you know other characteristics and flavors to the wine. So with white wine, you can make actually white wine from red grapes too. It's a little atypical, but it does happen. Oh, um, so any grape has the ability to become a, a white wine. But standardly, they take the white grapes, they take the grape varieties, they press them, extract the juice, and ferment that. Um, with red, it's a whole different process where they take the grapes, they crush them, they let the skin macerate for a period of time, extract all the pretty color and, and flavors and pigments, um, and then they ferment. So, so that's the big difference there. No, that's um, interesting. You know, uh, I wanted Tony to come on the show, and I'm so glad she did because wine and Tony herself is a hidden treasure. She so, <laughs> has so much knowledge and so much information that you're flattering me. My head's going to get so big. <laughs> and Julio's, if you're watching, raise time. I'll be, I'll be following up on that. Um, so, so you have the red wine and the white wine, yeah. and now when wine is made with fruit like blueberries or things like that? Is it the same process, only the fruit is different? Is that? Yeah, a, a lot of times people will call like, you know, wine, wine, um, alcoholic beverages made from other um, fruits, they'll call that wine, but that's sort of a misnomer. It's, it's not technically wine, because wine's just from grapes, but there's not really another term for it. So I guess fruit wine is appropriate. And you don't really see it as often. It's a, usually a little bit more expensive to make a yes. complete alcoholic beverage from like say strawberries or raspberries, because there's not as much juice. Grapes naturally right. have a lot of juice content, um, and so it's easier to work with. If you're doing it from raspberries, for instance, you're gonna need a ton of raspberries to make the product. It's gonna be expensive. and I, um, I just, the industry, usually the people can't really um, profit off of it, you know? For a bottle of pure raspberry wine, it'd probably end up costing you 50 bucks for that. Right. And who, you know, there's like, not really a market for a $50 raspberry <laughs> no. wine, you know what I mean? Uh, um, Boone's Farm. Uh, yeah. They still make Boone's Farm wine. They do. You can find it. it. When I was a kid, <laughs> not me, you know, I, was, I was eating Turkish taffy in different yeah. flavors. Uh, but they would drink, a lot of the teenagers would drink Boone's Farm Wild yeah. Apple, Wild Strawberry, oh, you know, yeah. and it costs like a dollar a bottle, or Mad Dog 2020. Oh yeah, that's still around. Which, yep. uh, being Jewish, I know that stands for Mogan David. And, uh, <laughs> they add more alcohol to it. Mm -hmm. It's traditionally the wine of people that you see horizontally on sidewalks in front of City Hall and other yeah. places. It's, yeah. It's, uh, we used to call it a wino's wine. And mm -hmm. I used to feel sorry when I saw somebody buy it because I knew they weren't going out to the castle oh, yeah. restaurant and having that as the They first. have fun in the moment, but they might regret it the next yeah, day, so. right? The yes. next morning. Um, but yeah, the, a lot of the local wineries we see around here, they take um, regular grape juice as a, like the grape must as a base, and then they'll um, macerate fruits into it so that uh -huh. it's a little bit of a mixture. I know Hardwick does that. I know Neshoba does that a lot. Um, so you have the base is wine, but you're pulling flavors from other fruits. So that sort of helps cut costs a little bit. Yes, yes. You still get the flavor from the fruits, um, but you're not spending as much money kind of sourcing all the fruit that you would need to make now, to make the wine. So Now in cooking, I, I know you can correct me if I'm wrong. I heard that if the wine isn't good enough to drink, you shouldn't cook with it. Julia Wild, uh, Julia Wild, Julia Child, yeah. that was her mantra. Right. You know, you have to, I think you bring up a really good point because I get that a lot. I get that question a lot where people, you know, they spend all this money on a beautiful piece of steak. Like, right. you know, you spend $20 on this beautiful cut and you bring it home and then you look, you're sifting through your cabinet and you pick out a two week old mm. wine to pour on top of it. Right. It's like, oh my Lord, you know, why would you corrupt that with, 
you have to, you sort of have to make sure that your, all your ingredients are fresh. That's really important. You don't want to um, pour something that's old or disgusting, something that you wouldn't personally drink. Why would you put that in a right, recipe? Because it's not going to get better. You know better. what I mean? Are you yeah. gonna Are you gonna pick a, a moldy piece of cheese to put on top of a fresh salad? Right. You're, you're not gonna unless it's supposed to be Only a moldy. For a couple of yeah, unless, like unless yeah. it's like a blue cheese and it's supposed to be moldy, I give but them like. Modium chaser. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I think Julia Child's and uh, like totally an idol in that respect because I appreciate that she said that and I, I appreciate when people, you know, pick a wine that you personally would drink. Part of the fun is drinking while you're cooking, right? Yes. Oh, yes. To a certain degree. <laughs> right. As long as you're within safety <laughs> limits, right? Well, remember that famous <laughs> Julia Child where Dan Aykroyd did a chicken? Did you ever see that? I don't, I, you no, should I look don't know that if up. I did. I will, I will. He does Julia Child and he cuts himself and then he bleeds more and more and more <laughs> until he falls over the table. And just stays that's there. So you know? funny. So oh. that's good. Uh, now, cooking wine, I've seen it in supermarkets. Yeah. I understand that it's really bad. It's like, it's like a lot of salt or sugars, or it's not really wine, so to speak. Yeah, like cooking wine. Yes, um, yeah. If it's sold in a grocery store, it's not wine at all because it doesn't okay. have alcohol in it. So it's probably like a, a knockoff kind of gimmicky, gimmicky, gimmicky thing. And you know, it just sort of, it, de it depends. Some people um, have used it in recipes their whole life and they're used to the taste, and that's fine. But um, I would say do go for the real stuff, you know? Go for the real stuff. Um, you can find affordable bottles of wine that aren't going to break your bank. We have a de definitely a ton of under $15, under $10 options. Um, any liquor store should have a couple things that could be within a, pri a reasonable price point that are still quaffable that you could put into a recipe and... and you know, not faint over the price. Right. You know, <laughs> when I cook, I, as a matter of fact, I was out to Julio's and I was making uh, veal masala. So oh, I yeah. just bought, the wine was 10 or four, $12, something like yeah. that. And it was perfect. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to buy... Masala doesn't have to be expensive. It's, um, I mean, one of the brands that I like is Florio and there's another one in Trochia that's great. And they're all under $15. And they taste really um, and, good, and you know. It's yeah, not, it's delicious, and it it really enhances the experience, the dining experience. No, um, yes, thanks, thanks, Tony. <laughs> I'm telling you, a font of information that I never knew. <laughs> now, I want Tony to comment on this. I was speaking to her before the show of someone that did a wine review, and I didn't even understand any of it, but this was the wine review from a friend of mine who's a wine snob, so to speak. <laughs> uh, she knows what that is. because She's not one, but she's a wine expert. <laughs> now, this was his review. 215 Chablis Premier Cru Veillant from Christian Moreau, medium gold. Hermes whispering into the ear of a bust of Homer saying, this is great Chablis. Generous notes of fennel, oyster shell, and coral, which you always like to crunch in the wine. Strawberry stem and carnations, soft yet firm grip, excellent intensity, and nice nervous tension in the length, which is, of course, mandatory. Um, so I am never disappointed by this producer. Homer replies, epic. Now, similar to the United Nations, where they all wear headphones with the translation, what in heaven's yeah. name does that yeah. mean? I love when people get creative and kind of goofy and fun and have fun and be playful with their wine descriptions, but it also can be like extremely intimidating for a consumer because, you know, who goes around crunching on carnations? You know, that was one of the, oh, the right. flavor descriptors, like, <laughs> I don't know, really know what a carnation tastes like. So much of what we experience with wine is tied to what we taste and what we smell and what we smell is directly related to our memories. So for me, it's really important when you're using descriptors um, to make sure you're using descriptors that make sense to an average person who goes around like, you know, what was one of the other notes like Hermes? Yeah, like coral. coral I know. mean, I don't know about you, but I'm not licking shells in coral no. um, all the time. So I understand what he was going after that sometimes. Um, Sometimes sommeliers will use descriptors like minerality. Well, what does minerality right. mean? I guess that's what he meant by coral and shells because 
there are a lot of soils, and especially in Chablis, it's all limestone, and the soils are, some of it's Kimmeridgian um, limestone, which basically are fossils. Right, they're right. seashells, they're crustaceans that over time have been compressed together. Um, so yeah, when you're getting a chalky note in a white wine, especially a Chablis, which is Chardonnay, by the way, a lot of people don't realize that Chablis is Chardonnay, um, you will get a lot of minerality. Um, Everyone tastes minerality different. Um, some people probably are more going to relate to salty or ocean breeze as a descriptor, as right. opposed to like crunching on a coral, right. you know? Well, um, the same guy, like I mentioned to you, used uh, with a hint of manure. So, I mean, if that wouldn't turn you off. Yeah. But yeah. believe it or not, other wine snobs were answering him. Yeah. And mo three of the people that I know are good with wine uh, said, what do you mean by manure? I mean, that's like, you know, if you go into a restaurant and says, oh, our steak mm -hmm. today is just divine, has overtones of manure and leather. Yeah. Oh, yeah, bring me the extra <laughs> big piece. It's you so know? funny because, like, normally you wouldn't think anything, bar we call that barnyard, a yeah. barnyard descriptor. Um, normally, if you were to hear something smells of, man taste of manure in barnyard in, like, cow, cow right. hooves, <laughs> right. you would run for the hills, right? Yeah. But in the wine world, it's sort of, a descriptor for old world, an old world experience, and actually it's directly relatable to the hygiene of the winery. And most old world wines, especially in Burgundy, in France, in Italy, um, where the winery's been, probably hasn't been meticulously cleaned with a toothbrush in, you know, generations, right. they're going to have a little bit of an earthy funk. I call that funk, right, you know, it has right. a little bit of an earthy funk. Um, a lot of people appreciate that and love that in a wine. Um, it's, actually connected to Britannomyces, which is a bacteria that can cause that kind of funk. But yeah, it's a scary descriptor. It does exist, but it's a scary descriptor, yeah, right? It, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm thinking, you tell that to an average person, then they're going to go, yeah. what does that mean? But I wanted to ask you about um, expensive bottles of wine. Like, I understand mm -hmm. uh, some wines can go into the hundreds or even thousands of yeah. dollars worth. Now, are those wines worth, could you give us an example of one of those wines, and is that worth actually investing in, will it, get, will it gain money in the future? Yeah, I mean, a lot of, probably the most expensive wine, wine category in the world is first growth Bordeaux, so classified Bordeaux houses. Um, Something, for an example, like Chateau Latour or uh, Mouton Rothschild, uh, those houses go for about $800 to $1,000 a bottle. And, and now, do, so which is crazy. Do they increase uh, in value over the years? If they're stored properly. So that's a right, big pr right. that's a big thing is that you really have to be a collector and you have to have the right storage, um, I guess, facility, for lack of a better word, storage cellar. You know, some place that doesn't fluctuate in temperature, um, has a cellar temp, which is around like 60 to 65 degrees consistent. No, I'm sorry, like 50 to 55 degrees consistent um, Fahrenheit. And is not in direct sunlight and somewhere where you can place the bottles on the side and they won't be jostled or moved. So, so this, uh, little this contact, placing the bottles on the side, a cool, consistent temperature and away from direct sunlight. Not a lot of people have that kind no, of a location. No. But you can buy, I, and I've seen, um, the little uh, wine storage. You know, it's temperature yeah. controlled and um, it's, you know, perfect for the wine. And if I was going to spend, if I had that much money yeah. to spend on wine, then I would certainly buy one of those. You know? I kind of joke around because people expect that I have a huge collection just because naturally I'm in the industry and I'm a lover. I'm a lover right. of wine. But I live on the third story of an apartment building and it gets hot in the summer and it gets really cold in the winter and I just don't have the capability to properly store wine so there's not really wines that I hold on to for very long so I would recommend like you said if you want to become a serious collector or you have a little extra disposable cash and want to treat yourself to a couple nice bottles get a fridge um, or you know, invest in like a locker. Yes. You know, there's a lot of places that rent space, kind of do your research, try to find a place where you can store the bottle so that they can age in the proper environment. Um, or maybe spend the $1,000 on a plane ticket to France, go visit the <laughs> chateau yourself. <laughs> I'd like to do that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Tony, believe it or not, 
the half hour. What? Is that flew by. Over. Oh my goodness. You were a pleasure to have on. I hope you'll come again. Yeah. And Tony was kind enough to bring me a gift. Can I? Oh, oh sure. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to drink this on the way home. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> or when you get home. <laughs> she brought me a beautiful, is it a Taylor, f Taylor Flaggate port, tonic port. port. Yeah. Uh, in a bottle that looks like it came from the 1700s. Yeah, uh, so it's a throwback bottle. It's a retro um, bottling that they did to celebrate the 325th anniversary. Well, thank so. you. That was very sweet of you to do oh, that. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, I always come bearing gifts. Oh, boy, that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, I'd like to have you back on the show so we could cover some more territory. And sure. I want to thank you for coming on. You've brightened up our day and you've brightened up the studios. And I'm sure the viewers will enjoy this when it yeah. airs. Well, thank you so much and for having me. Thanks for coming. Me. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Phil. Take care now.